Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jacob Restituto, and I'm a musician from Northport, New York. And today we have the absolute pleasure of chatting with Derek Wells all the way from Nashville today. If you listen to country music or anything related to country music, man, you've heard this guy's guitar work and a bunch of other work as well. Dude, I was listening to your disco. I do research on all my, my guests before I, they come on the show. And I was looking at your discography and I, I, every A, B, C, D list level you know, country <laughs> artist, you've worked on their album in the past. And the crazy part is it's all been in the past year. To, I mean, you've been doing this for years and years, but I, the list that I was looking at, I was like, oh, shoot, we're still in 2022, 2021. Dude, you work <laughs> like crazy, man. Yeah. But first of all, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the channel. I really appreciate you here. Oh man, uh, happy to happy to talk shop always. Absolutely. So for people that aren't familiar with you, I was sorry. I apologize because I, I was just fan fan girling over here with like, no, no, shoot, no. man. As a guitarist myself, like you know, con in country music, especially in country music, because country music is such a um, guitar heavy. I was like, this yeah. guy is really you know played a lot of stuff, man. It's pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I say. You know, you can blame me. I guess if it's, ah, if it's one of those. Exactly. People that doesn't like country music, I can I'll take the blame. Ah, that's amazing. That's so good. So, for people that aren't familiar with you just yet, can you give a little backstory of you, who you are and, and your story in the music industry? Yeah, um, I still kind of always when anyone asks what you know, if I'm at dinner and I meet a stranger and they say, "What do you do?" I'm like, obviously I'm in the music <laughs> business, and if they if they pry further, I say, "Well, I play guitar," uh, and that's still kind of mostly how I identify as a guitar player. I think, you know, they definitely all started a guitar for me. And, and, you know, I mean, now it's, it's a little more complicated than that because I, you know, I'm a producer and I also have a joint venture with a publisher here in Nashville called spirit music, my company Two mix music. So I also, you know, sign and develop and, and work with young songwriters and try to help them go out and be successful and young writer producers and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, there's, there's kind of, you know, three to four hats, you know, I, I serve on a lot of boards, you know, in this, in the town now here in Nashville for, you know, the CMAs and Grammys and other things like that. So, uh, but I still kind of always default to, I play guitar because, because that, that still is kind of what I feel. I think that's probably still the most like of my identity that I draw um, in the, in the business. Um, and yeah, like a lot of people, you know, I um, started out kind of just taking anything I could back in the day. And, and then I, um, uh, you know, I started getting some work in the kind of the live avenue, mm. right? Uh, started playing shows and then started touring. And um, uh, you I know, would actually love to hear a, hear a bit of that. Actually, that's that's a great segue into the, the beginnings of it. You know, because yeah. all the stuff that you've done in the past, you know, years you've been in the industry, um, the beginning steps. You know, we we were we were talking briefly before we started filming that you yeah. grew up in Nashville which yeah. I don't think a lot of people can actually that are in Nashville actually can say. Uh, yeah, so yeah. that's pretty cool in the, in the first part. Were your parents musicians? Yeah, so yeah, that's great. So we'll just we'll start at the beginning. So yeah, my parents are 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 and were both musicians, still are. Um uh my dad's a guitar player. Um my 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 mom is a is a singer um um and, and piano player and multi-instrumentalist multi-instrumentalist and uh songwriter also and actually my stepdad is also a guitar player a guy that's been my stepdad for 20 something years now is also a, a musician and um so you know the music bug didn't catch me until a little bit later in life um you know i i a common story i hear from people here in Nashville creatives that I meet or, or not necessarily just in Nashville in general is, is, you know, you'll hear this story of, well, my parents weren't musical at all, but, but my dad loved music and we, we would always listen to like the Beatles and Johnny Cash records and, you know, Led Zeppelin in my house. And you know, my parents were passionate about music, but they were a lawyer or whatever. And for, for me, the, the, the growing up experience couldn't have been more opposite. It was very much that like music was work in my household you Very know, my, my, my parents moved to Nashville to to be musicians and to, to work and and they kind of always existed in that live touring world. Um, they were fortunate enough to get, you know, some some pretty good, you know, decent gigs with some legitimate artists and um, and do that for a long time. But there was a lot of travel involved. Right. They were gone a lot uh, when I was a kid. And um, and yeah, when, when when there was music playing at my house, it was one of them like trying to learn something for, a, <laughs> you know, a show or something. And, 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 you know, bluntly, not all of it was really great. You know, it was um, so so we didn't do a lot of like recreational music listening in my house. Mm. And um, 
so you know i would say a i started casually listening to music and finding music the way that someone in a completely unmusical house would have it was just the radio or like what my friends listened to you know mm -hmm. um you know i i i you know i didn't even know or really care who the beatles were until i was in my 20s you know which is you know crazy now in hindsight but so that was kind of the thing and, and i was a real active kid i played a lot of sports i went to a smaller school and you know, was active throughout the year, just kind of filled my time with activities all, all the time. And so, so the music bug didn't really take, um, you know, when I, when I got to be in my teens, I had a cousin that played drums and he kind of wanted me to be in a band with him, <laughs> which all that meant was we played in his basement. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I would I kind of start to pick up the guitar a little bit, um, mostly just because I wanted to hang out with him, not necessarily because I was super passionate about it. And, um, you know, my dad or stepdad would, would hear me kind of banging around in there on something and they'd come in and say, hey, you want me to show you? And I, and I would immediately just put it down. No, 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 I'm good. I'm good. Because because I knew how good they were. And, sure. and I was I was embarrassed. To, how you old know, were you at this point? I was probably like 14. 14, 15. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I kind of like, you know, I, I'd hail the guitar. I knew a couple of chords, but, you know, nothing serious. And then I went to college, right? And I was going to be a print journalism major. Hmm. And, um, and I had this kind of typical freshman schedule where my classes were all at like 8 a.m. And I'd be done by like 10, 30 or 11 every morning. And <laughs> And that was the first time in my life, like I had all this free time, mm. you know, I wasn't playing sports. I wasn't involved in any other kind of thing. And I went to this school. I didn't know anybody. So I didn't really have much of a friend group yet. And, and, um, this was also, you know, this was 2001. This was like, right when Napster came out, people remember things like LimeWire, all LimeWire, baby, a hundred percent. Yeah, Right. And, um, and so I remember coming home one weekend and asking my dad, like, hey, do you, is there a guitar you don't use that you wouldn't mind me taking up to school? And he, he gave me some like Yamaha electric guitar or something. It's like, yeah. And, and, um, and he gave me a, uh, he let me take a, a version one pod. Remember those other kidney bean yeah, pods? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I went to like Radio Shack and just with this bizarre series of connectors was able to figure out a way to like, with my little laptop, like listen to music on headphones and play guitar through the, through the thing. I mean, this was before, you know, you could buy a DAW on your, you know, this wasn't, this was, you know, Logic and GarageBand and things like that did not exist. And at that time, Pro Tools was such a like, I mean, I didn't even know what Pro Tools was first mm -hmm. off. But even if I had, it would have been outside of my, you know, scope financially to have something like that. And, you know, but I was able to kind of do this thing. And, and that kind of season of my life is really where like the bug caught me is that, you know, I would come back and I would I'd go do classes and I'd come back and I'd sit there in my dorm with my headphones on and my little guitar and just kind of dinker around and, you know, fumble my way through songs. But I, I really enjoyed doing it. And, you know, fast forward about a year, you know, I wasn't loving college. I wasn't thriving there at all. Um, in fact, I was really struggling. And, you know, so I'm going to come home and, 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 and came home and spent a couple months at the house kind of figuring out what I was going to do with my life. And, and this kind of really simple idea came to me that was like, well, you know, I really like playing guitar now. I don't, I never get tired of doing it. It's, you know, it's always something I want to go do. I'm like, really, I feel like I'm passionate about it. And it's like, I should try to play music, you know? And my parents were horrified. So, you know, they... Um, can you elaborate on that briefly? Because I can yeah, assume yeah. why, but I just want to hear... I want yeah, to hear no, yeah. For, well, for, I think for a few reasons. I think that... I think, you know, initially they had some very legitimate concerns about like well Derek you're getting a late start like you know my dad started playing guitar when he was like five that was know? the exact point I was going to make before, when you started when you were talking about that I apologize to interrupt but like oh, no, no. I find that super fat like amazing and the fact that like 
I kind of had a similar story. I was, you know, I started playing music when I was 15. I didn't listen. I was not a musical kid, you know, like growing up. I had started playing when I was 15 for my church band because they needed a band. I was like, I'll learn the guitar. Sure. You know, and then I slowly started singing, you know, very, sim- very, very similar process. And, um, and I can, and I, I find it so fascinating where I'm meeting people now there and they're like, I love music. I play these things, but I'm too afraid to take the leap because I ha- I didn't start when I was, you know, six. Right. And I was like, well, neither did I. And to hear what you're up to these, like doing and stuff. And you started in your, you really got serious in your tw- in, like 1920. Like yeah. that's remarkable actually. And I'm, that's actually really encouraging for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I always say, you know, my joke is I always say, you know, genetics helped me close the gap probably because <laughs> I, you know, obviously was born with some, some predisposition I can see in hindsight now, you know, but but what I was going to say was, you know, that was the, and this ties in, you know, I think those were the, some of their legitimate fears that they had, you know, and they just know from their own perspective, they know how hard of a business. Exactly. Like they knew yeah. how competitive it was yeah. and how challenging it was. And these are it's kind of the, op- again, the opposite of most people. A lot of people come from families and they don't know how the music business works <laughs> and they, their, their idea of a guitar player is like the guy that plays at the bars on the weekends, but but my parents knew exactly what it was and they were, they were fearful. And I think the, the, the second, that's and so the, it, it, that's such I, an I think, interesting perspective. Before, I, I think I the second and, and the, the bigger fear that they had was this narrative and that they had in their minds that maybe, okay, Derek kind of struggled in college and he's kind of waffling a little bit. And, you know, maybe he thinks this music thing's just going to be easy and that he can do that because we do it or that somehow we're going to help him or that we'll be able to help him which they knew, of course, wasn't the case. Um, and, and it was actually, for me, internally, um, it was actually the exact opposite. I knew how good they were. I had a very, very real understanding of where the bar was, and I knew I was not there yet. So, so me making the declaration of, like, I think I want to try to do music didn't mean, like, Hey, I'm ready to go out and make money doing this and and be be a professional. It meant that like I would like to start this journey of of you know being in music and learning and getting better. Because you know, uh, for people that move here to, to to Nashville a lot, and I hear this story so often is, you know, they were all the best musician in whatever town they came from. You know, they were the best singer or the best piano player or the drummer or whatever, and then they come here. And they have to get their ass handed to them because they real it, the, the talent pool in a city like this, or if you're in Los Angeles or New York, probably the same. It's like, it's just so deep, right? The depth chart is so deep. It's that jump from, you know, high school to college, college to the NFL sure. kind of thing in sports. And so, you know, a lot of people come here thinking they're way more ready and then have to take a, take a step or two back and, you know, mm-hmm. gather themselves. And I walked into it knowing like, Hey, I'm not ready. Hmm. Um, but I want to try to do it because I'm passionate about it now, you know. So, so again, that first kind of, and I was about 18 at this time. It was like my, you know, I spent 18 months waiting tables. You know, I was, my dad was gracious enough to let me live in his basement for rent free. You know, I just kind of had a little car payment and like a cell phone bill. So I was, my overhead was low and I waited tables and, you know, that like year, year and a half, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't hang out with friends. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't do anything. I waited tables, made as much money as I could. I used that money to buy myself gear mm. one piece at a time. You know, I'd make, I'd make enough money to go buy a little delay pedal, you know, this and that and, and do the thing. And, and, um, and I just practiced, man. I would just all, all day, every day. And I, um, after a few months of that, my parents started to kind of see like, okay, He's being serious about mm-hmm. this. Like he's, you know, because I was living at home with my dad. So my dad knew, like, man, this kid's like, he's, I hear him playing when I go to sleep. And when I wake up, he's playing. And, you know, and he's, and so they started to kind of then like whisper, like, hey, you know, if you're serious, you, you should probably go get it. There's a book about the Nashville number system. You know, all the musicians here use it. You should probably go get it if you're serious about this. And like, Is that okay, different fine. than the normal number system? No, it's just kind of what we call it, you know, here. It's like, hmm. There is a great book called, but it's a guy's name Chaz Williams that wrote the book. It's just the Nat, they call it the Nashville number system, but it's one through, you know, there's, yeah. there's seven notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anywho, um, but they started kind of like suggesting, you know, my dad would say, hey, you know, if you get on a 
if you do go play, someone might ask you to do this, or they, you know, you probably need to go buy this pedal. You probably need to this. Okay. All right. Okay. I would. Um, and then, you know, I do those kinds of things. And, um, and then really it was a, it was a really chance. I wasn't even trying to put myself out there. I wasn't asking anyone to play guitar. I wasn't literally nothing playing songs in my basement. I would go buy records and learn them cover to cover as, as best as I could, you know, still getting better. There were times I got hung up, um, couldn't figure out how they were doing something. And at this uh, point, 95% of it must've been still by ear. There wasn't like ultimate guitar at that point, you know, like, Oh dude. Yeah. Yes, all by no, ear. Exactly. You couldn't get on the internet and look up tab. YouTube exactly. didn't exist. None of these things. It was just rewinding in my, which you makes know, you that much better of a, I, I was recently telling this story to somebody that, uh, a couple of years back, I was auditioning for a wedding band, um, yeah. and this guy gave me a list of probably one of the best guitar players that like I know locally. Like he's yeah. he's in his fifties at this point. Like so he went you know went to Berkeley, like top notch yeah. guitar player. And he gave me this list of probably two hundred songs. He's like look, listen, learn these songs, but yeah. try your best to learn them from ear because it'll teach yeah. you it'll teach you how to hear music even that much more. And I did, and man, it changed me as a musician. I hear, I can hear the, I, oh, that's a four, five, one, you know, that's oh, the one, three, you know, I hear it now because because I le- had to learn it, and so I, I, you know, yeah, it's it's it's, I, it's invaluable. I mean, again, in hindsight, that period for me, sure. Is, you know, I, I tell people a lot. That was like my ten thousand hours, hundred percent. You know, um, and and then you know, it's uh, you know, truly, I can't make this up, but like a. A girl I waited tables with was a like a singer songwriter, and we had talked about music a little bit. And she had an opportunity to go play a, a, a little show. We call them writers rounds here in Nashville. It was like you know three or four songwriters get up on a stage, just play their songs acoustic, that kind of thing. And she wasn't a confident guitar player, and asked me if I would come play acoustic for her this round if I'd learn her songs and. And I said, yeah, sure, that seems harmless. You know, I can come do that, you know. And um, play this show, and and this guy comes up to me at the show and says, hey, man, I, nice to meet you. And he said, I know we don't really know each other, but I play for this artist, and she's got a show in two days. And, man, I can't do it, and I have called every sub I know. Like, I, I know, like, would you want to do it? Do you, do you, you know? And he was like, he was like do you play electric guitar, too? I said, yeah, yeah, I do, you know. And uh, he was like, all right, well, you know, meet me. Here's my address, you know, come, come by the house. I and mean, it's literally like, again, we didn't back then. You couldn't just like email somebody all the music. Right. Yeah. So I showed up the next morning and went to this guy's house and got his, got two CDs worth of music. And he gave me some notes about a set list. And he's like, the bus is going to leave at this time, this day, like be there. Okay, cool. So then I told my parents about it and they started kind of getting panicky, right? They're like, whoa, 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 because they knew who the artist was. And they're like, okay, well, that's, man, that's Derek. Are you sure? Like, you you know, and I remember them kind of giving me a few tips. Like my dad was like, hey, like, make sure you at least learn, you know, this and do, you know, like, I got it, I got it, you know, I'm going to be okay. I got it, I got it. So I go, you know, I spend a day and a half working up the songs just as best as I possibly can and, and um, and I had written charts for everything. By this point, I was pretty good at writing a chart and had it all super prepared. And I go to get on the bus. And short version, this guy had not told the band he wasn't coming. And I get on the bus. They didn't know that he was going to have a sub. And here's this 19-year-old kid, you know. And they're like panicky you know, they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, freaking out and, you know, I'll never know for sure, but in hindsight, I think they probably were outside trying to get some other guitar play. Like, I think they were probably trying sure, to call sure, somebody sure. that they knew, Sure. but it, but the bus had to roll. Like we, it was, we had to go, but you know, and they were stuck with me, man. You know, it was one of those situations. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, the more they talked to me on the bus, they started to warm up. Cause I think they could just tell, well, well at least he's prepared. Okay. This sure. is, this is all really, we're caught really off guard here, but he's got all the music and he knows, you know, he says, like, you know, well, I guess we'll see, you know. And it was one of these festivals too, where like, 
you know, it was a bunch of country acts playing and we were playing in the afternoon and there was no sound check. It was, you know, we call it, you know, <laughs> we call it, you know, wire and fire. And so they couldn't, I mean, it was, you know, I think in hindsight, I just remember, I, th I think now as an adult, I think back and those poor guys, man, they must've just been counting off the first song thinking, here we go. What in the hell is about? To and happen? then back to what I was saying in the beginning, like uh, country music is so guitar heavy. Like, if that's oh, yeah. gone, like man, you're you're not much left with much. Oh dude, yeah, like I mean, the, the you know the sig on every song was guitar, you know, it's yeah, just one yeah. of those things. So, anyways, it it went fi it went fine, um, you know, um, and I think a combination of they were just so relieved that it went well and so mad at that other guy that they were just kind of like, hey man. She's only got like eight more shows the rest of the year. Do you want to just do them all? It's like, yeah, yeah, sure. And and then that led to, you know, a few months later, the bass player in that band said, Hey, I'm doing this other thing too. And then mm -hmm. the dates don't don't conflict and you can do them both. And would you want to that guitar player just left? And yeah, do this. And yeah, can't sign me up, you know. And I started doing that and and was doing those still working like a job, you know, still like waiting tables when mm -hmm. I was home. And then um, that kind of went on for a few months. And then one of the guys that played Steel and one of those bands called me and said, hey, you know, I'm out with this guy, Josh Turner. He's, you know, he's doing pretty good. He's had this hit song and um, his guitar player, just, we're in Florida and the guitar player just quit to take this other gig. And he's like, they're going to do auditions. Do you want, do you want in? And I was like, yeah, I want, uh, yeah, well, I would like to audition. And I, so I did an audition and got, got in with Josh. And then that's where I stayed for, I was there with him for five years with Josh Turner touring. And I kind of quickly became his, his band leader. Uh, the guy that quit was the old band leader. And, and we just kind of didn't have one for a little bit. And then after I'd been there about six months, Josh was like, Hey man, do you want to just be the band leader? Mm -hmm. And which was again, an interesting dynamic. Cause at that point I'm like 21 and some of the dudes in the band were 50. Sure. But, you know, it was what it was. Everybody was great. Uh, that was a good, good thing. Um, and, um, and, you know, interesting point, like, even, like, even when I got that gig, like, when I got the, when I did the audition, and I got asked to come out there, man, I, I still was, like, just barely good enough to have done that gig. Like, I had gotten myself to the point where, I could learn his records and learn the parts and recreate them, you know, pretty good. Um, you know, I could learn the solos and all that kind of stuff. And, um, uh, but you know, my ear was always getting better and there were probably a few notes I wasn't playing right, you know, here or there, but everybody was cool and the vibe was good and I was doing it. And so even after I got the gig, I was like still, like I would come home and still pull his records on and try to like learn them. Cause like, as my hands were getting better and as my ears were getting better and, and I was getting more comfortable on the job, I started like revisiting and kind of being like, Oh wow. I've, I've been playing that wrong this whole time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's close, but I can tell now he's mm -hmm. actually, if there's one extra note in it that I've been missing this whole time or, or whatever. Um, so I spent the first two years with Josh kind of in that headspace where I was still, you know, really focused on continuing to grow. And, and of course now I'm, now I am, that's my full-time job. Like I'm making some decent money. So I started like buying equipment and like trying to elevate that part of my thing and get, you know, continue to have myself tour ready, you know? Um, Cause when I again, same thing with on the gear perspective, when I got the gig, I had just enough. In fact, I didn't, I had to borrow one guitar I had to borrow a guitar from my dad because there was one song in Josh's set that needed a crazy tuning. And I, the way it panned out, I couldn't do it in, in real time. And I had I just asked my dad for a loaner for a while and then <laughs> saved up enough money and bought one. And so I could give him the loaner back. And so that was kind of the first couple of years. And then it was about the, about two and a half years. I, I, I felt really comfortable. I was like, you know what? I'm in a good spot here everything's going great. Josh's career was going well. Um, but I, I kind of knew I didn't, I didn't want to do the touring game for the, a long, long, long time. And I was always just more passionate about 
the studio and recording and and hearing my my own parents kind of reverence for the Nashville recording community as a kid growing up you know it was just like those are the baddest fuckers walking like that was just that was the you know in my house that was the that was the connotation is like man the other dudes that play on these records those are the baddest guys those are the best musicians in the world and you know kind of it was like you grow up being a Yankees fan, like your dream sure. is to go play for the Yankees, right? Sure. It's that kind of thing or whatever, insert whatever analogy you want. Yeah. So at that point, I started kind of looking around and going, all right, let me, when I'm home, like what could I do to start playing sessions? Yeah. And then that began a whole other, you know, avenue of search. And then it got to this point where, I started playing a few, started playing a few, started getting hired a little bit. And then some guys I trusted in that world finally kind of came to me and said, Hey, you, you can do this. You're, you're pretty good at this. Um, but it's going to be hard for you to really build your session career while you're still touring because mm. you're going to miss a lot of calls. You're going to be gone. And it's, you know, you know, um, and bluntly, you know, being low man on the totem pole trying to break in, like I needed to be in a place where I could take the last minute stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so after a kind of a lot of thought and a lot of talks and a lot of consideration, you know, I, once again, I left this real stable thing that was like, I was on a salary with Josh and I could have stayed there until he retired. I could still be playing for Josh. He's still a friend to this day and he was a great boss. And, um, but I just kind of was like, you know, I really want to be doing this thing over here. And that's the, you know, and that was something I was clear with Josh. Like when I left, you know, it was emotional. Like we were friends and I'd been there a while. And, and I just said, well, you know, I'm not leaving you to go to some other job. It's, it's not about money. It's not like, well, Carrie Underwood offered me more money. So I'm leaving you. <laughs> I was like, it's, it's literally a, a career path. That's just yeah. like, to change. And, and he understood that he knew that the guys that play on his records were incredible and that, you know, I wanted to kind of live in that world. And so, you know, did that thing and, and it kind of started over. And then I'm like back mm. to like, spent the first year and a half kind of starving. Like, you know, mm. I, I, you know, took my salary and, you know, and I'd been making a little bit of money playing sessions, but not, you know, I, I, I wasn't making like $50,000 a year playing sessions back. You know, I was, it was like, I just, just enough to scrape by. And I would still take every single gig in that when, period of time. When was this at this point was probably like, what? Oh, eight. No, that would have been like 2010, 2010, okay. 10 or 11, something like that. And uh, yeah, you know, I wasn't doing sessions every day. And the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is like the session thing doesn't, you know the pay can be very delayed right because you you don't like leave with a check it's like well when the stuff gets done they send you a check and sometimes mm -hmm. it takes a while you know you do a demo session that's going to pay you 170 dollars, and it might be three months before the check shows up <laughs> so you know it was it was tough and i would fill in all the gaps with like 40 dollar gigs at you know a local you know any, i mean anything like anything i could go play Hey, well, I can't pay you, but they'll give us a tab at the bar. Sure. Free dinner. Like, mm, okay. Yeah, for real. And I mean, just, <laughs> just taking everything, like wedding band, everything yeah. I could while trying to do the session thing. And and eventually it just in the same way that the, the road thing worked, it was like, eventually I played a gig with one person who invited me to come to a session. And it went, that session was the first time I showed up. And there were like other dudes that had played on hits. Like it was like a real session session. And, you know, one guy from that got my number and called me on a thing. And then the next time I did a session, one of the other writers was like, hey, I really like what you do. Would you come do a session with us? And, and you know, all those things. And so it just, it all kind of went from there again, you know? So, and that's where, you know, you find myself today, just kind of yeah. riding that, that whole thing. So, I want to I want to recap that because you, you mentioned so many amazing points in there and and I've in in the interviews and conversations that I've had uh it's really really fascinating when you see connecting parallels between all the people that have had tremendous success and, and sure, um sure. the parallels are all the same in all these conversations and and I want to reiterate them because I think so many people including myself and I think so many people start out with this expectation of like 
I'm a great musician. I rate great music. I'm going to release my first song, you know, I'm going to release my first song and I'm going to be on the radio and I'm going to tour the world. And, you know, it's, I, I, to some degree, I think you need that delusion to make that leap of faith. Sure. Um, Because if you don't have that, then you're just never going to do it. But that, but you learn really quickly that that's not the case, you know? (laughs) Um, But in all these people that I've talked to that have, you know, that are where they are, so many of them, the it starts with this humility of like, hey, I recognize that I'm 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 nobody right now, and I need to put in the work to become somebody. So I need to actually put in the hours of practice, and then not yeah. only do I need to put in the hours, I need to take opportunities wherever they come. You know, even if I was just speaking to somebody that that's now um, mixing some pretty you know top level records, but he started off with cleaning the toilets in a in a A level uh, um, yeah absolutely. studio. He literally was cleaning the toilets and getting coffee. But the, but he was he was there he was in this in yeah. you know and that like the humility of that and now he's mixing these big records but like that's a big difference and you have to have a long term perspective to see that you know mm-hmm. um, and then from that you know you said yes to every uh, a lot of opportunities you know and yeah. then created relationships I mean in all these conversations I've had the relationships that people have had are the really the break through things but if you're not prepared for the relationship then that relationship's mute you know what i mean you can have the yeah. best relationships in the world but if you're not ready for them you know if you didn't practice they, the guy would be cool yeah you know like <laughs> so well, that's um, not i used to have a i had a, a high school athletics coach that used to say that the definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity absolutely. and so that that thing like you said is it's like yeah you know you want to you want to you know, position yourself to have some opportunities come to you, but then you have to be prepared, you know, to, to, to you know, to effectively like navigate that opportunity. Right. So it's, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's so, it's so interesting. And then what I found very fascinating is um, the, 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 uh, the constant leap of faiths you had to take, you know, you had these relatively steady things and then you're like, Hey, you know, I, I, I this is not what I want, you know, you know, in, in my career. So, you know, not only did you have to drop out of college, then you had to you start, you know, start, you know, your career as a, um, you know, learning, learning the guitar, essentially, like really learning it. Then you started with the, you know, touring and then you start, you know, and then you had to leave that. And it's, that's scary, you know, when you're making some good money and you got to, yeah, and then you said you waited out for a year and a half. So not only did you like leave that leap of faith, hoping uh, into something kind of, you know, cushy and fluffy again, you <laughs> stick in you know eat dirt again you know well that's the thing i mean i try to be whenever i have a conversation with you know somebody that's trying to get in i try to be really honest about the the times when it was it was it was really scary yeah um you know because um and it's not a it's not meant to be a deterrent or to scare anybody off i to me it's about like managing your expectation yeah and just understanding, because, you know, to your point earlier about like the expectation and stuff, it's like, man, if, if, if you went out and had a run one day and, and you, you ended up running two miles and, and you felt really good after it, like you wouldn't just go run the Boston Marathon tomorrow. Like that's a big jump. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, you know, a win is a win is a win is a win. And that's great. And, you know, going out and running a couple of miles and feeling really good about yourself is a win. Like go, go do that again tomorrow and then try mm. to go run four and try to go run five, but don't just think that you're ready to go to the Olympics because, you know, you had a couple good small wins. Right. And, and, you because, just have to, and it's interesting that some people that do that opportunity does come to them. They're not prepared for that opera. Like, like again, they're not, you know, they, they, they get pushed into the, the, the mile, the marathon comes to them essentially when they're not ready for that marathon and it, right. it, it fizzles out really quickly. There's also the broader conversation of like really understanding what you do and what you're maybe right for, because, you know, there were, I mean, there's still things to this day that I get called for and I say, man, I, I'm actually not the dude, you know, if like, like, for instance, if somebody wanted to make like a really hardcore jazz record, you know, like, so I, you know, sometimes like I get called for a lot of Christmas projects around Nashville, especially for country artists. And, and I'm always honest. I'm like, man, if it's like jazz ish, or if there's like a jazz number or two, like, yeah, I'd love to be there and I can do it. And we'll, everything else will be kind of more in line. But if like, you're trying to go make like a Michael Buble record, like I'm probably not your guy. And, and, you know, y- yeah, you're turning down money and the opportunity to go be on this artist project, but like, 
it would be, I would be embarrassed and I know yeah. I'm not the right fit and I probably wouldn't, it probably wouldn't go well, you yeah. know? And so, so there's those kinds of, that's a kind of another broader part of the conversation, but like, yeah, you, you know, you, you always say yes, but you also have to be realistic about, about where you're at. And, you know, if I met a guy that told me like, man, it's crazy. I've been playing guitar six months and like through a bizarre series of events, you know, Katy Perry wants me to go out on tour with her. I would say, do not do that. Mm -hmm. You are this, this will probably not go well. Like mm -hmm. you are not in the same way that, yeah. And my friend that runs the marathons wanted me to go run the Boston marathon with him tomorrow. It's like, <laughs> man, you are not ready to run 30 mm -hmm. miles right now. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're not. So, you know, you have to kind of keep that little part of the conversation mm -hmm. intact too. So I always say like, always say yes, but not at the risk of throwing yourself into something that's going to end poorly or in, in embarrass you. Yeah, you know, very that. interesting. You also mentioned managing expectations with people that you have conversations with. And I think that's super, a very interesting conversation that needs to be had in the sense of like, you know, at this point, there's a bunch of people that reach out to me saying, hey, you know, like, I'd love to make a mu become a musician. Like, do you have any tips kind of thing? You know, like, I like music. This is an interesting conversation right here. I really like music. I'd like to become a musician. And like you said, managing expectations to some degree, I'm like, if you have to flat out be like, yo, this, like your parents were concerned, this life kind of sucks for a long, long time, oh, you know? Yeah, and like, yeah. but the only reason I, we stick it out is because like, I don't have another option. Like, this is what I have to do. Like, I don't have, like, yeah. you know, my wife and I have been together for a long time, but when we were first got married and a little before then, like, she's like, hey, like, I'm concerned. Like, <laughs> you're not making any money. And I'm like, I look, if we ever get to a point where we can't eat, I will go get a day job. But like, I don't have a plan B like this is it, you know? So if, if you're it, if that's you, then I rec then go for it. Cause you'll, you'll likely stick it out. But if it's like, Hey, I kind of like it. If it, I tell this one story because it's funny. I, when I first dropped out of college, I was never poor. I lived with my parents, but I didn't have extra, uh, cash, yeah. right. They weren't funding my life. Right. Yeah. Right. So it was pretty much what, like if I wanted to go out with friends, I had to pay for it. Right. Right. Yeah. Now I dropped out and I was 18 and all of my friends that were in uh, my age were still in college. So I started hanging right. out with the older people, you know, the older crowd in the later twenties, early thirties. Right. So they were going out to lunch one day and I won, I, I was so lonely cause I had no friends cause everybody else was in school or working yeah, and I was me. working was in my too. basement, right. By myself. I'm so lonely. So I was like, I want to go out to lunch, but I had no money. So I literally took chicken pot pie in a Tupperware to the restaurant with them. So they all <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> they, yeah. Everybody was offering to pay, probably more so because they were embarrassed of me. <laughs> yeah. We got it. We got it. We got it. We got it. Yeah. Put, put that away. Put that away. We got it. Oh, shoot, man. But Dude. if you're not willing to do that to some degree, like, I don't know if you're, you'll stick yeah. it. Yeah. You know? I um, mean, I, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I was like, man, I'm not, it's a good thing I'm pretty good at guitar because I'm not good at anything else. <laughs> and, and and certainly at this point you know i mean i'm i'm 20 years in at this point it's like there's no like there's no other option for me like this sure. is, is you know i'm gonna it's gonna look like my career is gonna look like what it looks like but this is gonna be my career and and um but like i i man i completely relate to the part you're talking about too because if i was in the exact same boat like when i came out of college and said i was gonna play guitar it was like all my friends were in college sure all my high school you know the kids i grew up with mm -hmm, like they're mm -hmm. in college and I remember like going and having a couple, a couple hangs with like some of them or like seeing some of their family, and then the parents being like, "And where are you in school, Derek?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm not. I'm 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 here. I'm gonna play guitar now." And you could just see on their face, they're like, "100 percent." Pray for that kid, you know, like he's, oh sure. Oh, what's your band called? I was like, no, yeah. no, I'm just gonna be a, <laughs> you know, I don't have a band. And they'd be like, "Oh, okay." And yeah, you could just feel it's like they stamped failure on your head. Oh you, man, I relate to that, that so unbelievably much. Yeah, you could you felt it, you know, that was the, that was 100%. the whole thing. Cuz it's just a hard especially when you're trying to get it going, there's not a lot of like tangible wins that other people can can see. Now, you, you know, being first person, you know, POV like you're trying to start the music business, you can see some of the small wins and you're yeah. reading the terrain and you're you know, you're the guy on, you know, running the miles going, whew, mile six got easier today. Mm -hmm. Mile eight got it. But if they're like, well, what races have you run? It's like, well, none. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But you're, do you go to the Olympic? No. Well, I'm, I'm a runner. Oh, 
okay, okay, sure. And so there's not a lot of big tangible wins for people when you're in that phase of your career to get on board and rally around. Mm. You know, it takes some sort of name associate takes you saying, well, I work with blank that they know, or this song, oh, I know that song, or, you know, or sometimes it's financial, or sometimes it's like, yeah, yeah I, I did this thing, and it paid a lot of money, and I got it, yeah. you know, you know, or, so it's, it, but it's, it's really hard, yeah. you know, at any age, if you're a kid starting out, if you're in your, you know, later in life starting out, it, that part of the career is so hard to have a, a bunch of people that can be supportive around you because there's just not a lot of tangible victories yeah. where they can say, you know, it's harder for them to kind of earmark the progress that you're having. You're the only person that can kind of see mm. it. it that and is so, so true, man. Um, I, I relate to that tremendously. And even to some degree, I, I want to add on to that, not only like it would have been monetarily or, you know, name, like, I don't want to say name dropping, but somebody that they would know, like, I think even to some degree, just time. Yeah, right. is a big aspect of like, oh, hey, you've been doing this for 10 years now. Yeah, you don't maybe not a millionaire, but like you're able to pay your bills, feed, yeah. feed your family like, oh, maybe it is a legitimate career. Like they still don't think, you know, it's it's still not you're not, play, you know, at the top of the list, and, but you're not also in the gutter anymore. And it's they kind of just, oh, he's a musician. Cool. I don't really know what he does. Yeah, well, but he's, they, <laughs> even if they maybe don't like are not impressed by it, they were at least able to get to a point where they accept it. Sure. Right. And, and, you know, by the way, too, uh, you know, uh, again, I want to kind of hammer this home that like that experience that I had when I was leaving college and went to try to do music, I think the exact same thing happened when I quit my road gig and and went to, to do sessions. I remember my yeah. grandmother, she cried when I told her I quit playing for this, this guy, Josh Turner, because she just couldn't believe it. Like she was a fan for one and that she told everybody in the nursing home that like my grandson plays for josh turner you know and he's been on the grand Ole opry and she just couldn't understand it like why do you not like working for well i'm gonna go try to do this and she's like okay all right you know and that's amazing and and i also remember a, a period you know i've told this story a lot i remember a um I was really committed to doing this, this studio thing, right? Really committed. And, and during this period of time, after I had quit my full-time road gig, you know, I had a handful of other artists, like really established artists, some, some bigger than Josh that called me and said, Hey, we heard you're not with Josh anymore. Are you looking? Cause we're, we're looking to make a change or, you know, and I was, and I would turn them down. Cause I just was like, no, I'm, <laughs> I want to, I want to go, I want to do this thing. I'm trying to stay focused here. And, and I, you know, I told, I, you know, I would kind of tell my parents, they're like, yeah, I turned down such and such the other day. And they're like, oh, wow, really? Okay. So I remember this one day and I was, I was so broke and I was, I was about to be like two months late on my mortgage. Like I, you know, I bought this little house and I live with Josh and I was about to, okay, like we were, it was like those, like in three days, if you have not caught up on your mortgage, we will start the process of foreclosure. And, and, um, I called my mom and, and, and I was like, I, is there any way you could loan me enough just to get like, you know, and I'll figure out a way to pay you back. My mom, you know, really sweetly was like, well, we can, we can do that, but I want to come like, let me come and let's have lunch. And I want to talk to you about it. And, you know, the crooks of that conversation was, she was like, well, you know, Derek, I mean, maybe it's just not like you know, your dad and I never played sessions really. And like, you know, maybe it's just not in a thing. And I mean, maybe you should consider taking one of these, you know, jobs, you know, there was one guy in particular that had called me an artist and it was going to be like a six figure, you know, a year gig. And I remember like pulling out my calendar, like my physical calendar and just trying to show her like, Mom, I, I get it. Like, I'm just waiting on the checks. Like, mom, like, look at all the set, like, look at everything I've been doing. Like, look at, look at all this. And like, I, like I'm, I promise like I'm this close, like it's, it's about to turn a corner. And like, you know, and I heard this record the other day and they copied all my parts in the demo. Like I'm doing the right things. Like it's getting close. Like I, you know, mm -hmm. and it's you back to that, feel thing. It, but it's, it's back to that reading the yet. terrain thing, you know? Yes. Like, that's so relatable, man. It's so interesting. And it was, it's like that thing of like, well, yeah, I'm still doing records. I mean, I'm, I'm, I haven't played on a big record yet, but like, all the demos I'm doing now are for all the big hit songwriters. Like it's getting closer. Like I, you know, 
and she was my mom was like really rad it's one of the best you know memories of her and she she kind of i could tell she was like still skeptical but was like okay honey okay all right you know and she was like well just you know pay us back when you can and i was like i, I you know i will and then and then fortunately and this kind of ties into that earlier conversation i had about how the money comes in for sessions it's it wasn't too long after that period that suddenly the checks kind of started to come in and, you know, it wasn't the stuff I'd done that week. It was the stuff I'd done three, four months ago. And it's still kind of that way to this day. You know, you, you if you're fortunate enough in, in that's kind of a, a particular thing about sessioning and you kind of get into that phase, you know, all the, all the money's kind of back, you know, back load, backlogged all the time. And you're dealing with these huge, you know, entities that do the accounting and all this stuff. So well, you just, hopefully you get to that point where you're working so consistently that there's always just checks coming and so, like I said, it's not what you made that week. It's what you, you know, it's what you did three months ago, four months ago, six months ago, eight months ago. And um, luckily, shortly after that, I kind of started getting to a little bit of a point where I was, it was bouncing out. Mm -hmm. I was able to like, you know, pay her back and was like, it's, thank you. We're like, it's, I'm good now. You know, yeah. like it's, we're starting to, it's all going to be, as long as I don't break my hands, like we'll be, we'll be yeah. good. Do you have hand so, insurance? Yeah, I actually do. Yeah, I believe it. That's um, serious yeah. about that. Yeah, no, I absolutely do. Um, so yeah, it's that. So that back to that conversation though about like, man, here's a here's my mom who completely gets the music industry. Yeah. You know, is a you know forty year, fifty year, something like you know professional in it, and has done it on a lot of levels. And even she was like a little skeptical and couldn't read the terrain yeah. that I was on like I could read it. That's you know. such a phenomenal analogy, man, because you're right. Even the people closest to you, they see all these things, but they don't see it. Like you like you said, you're running with somebody, but they're not going to know that you, mile six felt easier today. Like you, you feel only you feel that in your body. That's such a I mean, I love running. So like that's oh, also yeah. a great analogy. You know, I just yeah. got back from a four and a half mile run this morning. You know, there you like, go. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's so a, true, that's man. Yeah, absolutely. And like we mentioned at the very beginning of the conversation, you at this point in your career, you've worked with. I, I, I don't, I'm going to follow with this question because like, how do you, with everybody that you've worked with, whether it be Luke Holmes to carry on Newwood, to Thomas Rhett, to Tim McGraw, to Luke Bryan, to, you know, Kelsey Ballerini, like Marin Moore, everybody in the industry, right? Darius Rucker. Who is, who is somebody that you would, you have not worked with that you would love to work with? Oh, um, <laughs> so interestingly enough, there's, I mean, my answer, my answer forever has always been Paul McCartney. Paul, Paul McCartney. Um, but in a, in a in a nutshell, that's kind of uh, happening at the, at the moment right now on, a, on an interesting project that I can't really talk about. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm getting that. I'm going to be able to check that box, which is going to. Wow, my, man. Come on. Um, Congratulations. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. After that, I don't know what to. You know, that's like, it's like you take your kid in the toy store and, and then pick out anything you want and they pick the thing and then you immediately like, what else do you want? They're just going to stare at you. And that's, uh -huh. I'm definitely kind of still in this, uh, I've wanted to work with Paul McCartney for my the entirety of my musical life. And I'm actually kind of going to get that chance here on something. So, um, uh, how man, often in these know. sessions are you, um, in with the artist or are you there just while the artist is not there? Like, how does that work? Yeah, man, it's it's really case to case. It's a it really there really really is no answer um, because um, you know certainly a long time ago, as people became able to record themselves in their own studios or their own homes, and as that became more sophisticated, that was part of a thing. And then certainly COVID like rammed that thing home for a lot of folks. A lot of stuff became remote at that point in time. Um, but Nashville's amazing because we're still kind of one of the, we're still one of the anchors of like, we still all get in a room with a band and track, you know, the bulk of this stuff. Right. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it, it's artist to artist. There are some artists that are super, super involved and, and have a lot of opinions on a lot of stuff and want to be there to, to steer the ship and, 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 and bluntly just like the hang and love the studio environment. And, and then there are some people that I think are, you know, think of themselves a little bit more as, as entertainers and, mm. and they're, they're passionate about music, but the music is definitely a Very vessel to get them to, 
to where they they are. Um, wow, that's very and, interesting. Which is also fine, and and I think there's also people too that um, you know some of these producer artist relationships can you know get to a, a level where there's just so much trust. It's like, you know, we've had situations where we're trying to just get scheduling and like we're trying to meet deadlines, and the artist is on tour, and and they'll be like, you know what, I really like the demo, like Derek, I trust you, just like get you know. Yeah. Take, take, take some stuff from this and do this and go, go after it and send me what you got and we can figure it out. And, yeah. and you do that and you hope that it's like, oh man, yeah, it's great. I love this. Okay. Well, when I sing, I'll have some more notes and we'll do that kind of stuff. So, and then there's people that are there, you know, nose to tail, as I call it like that, are just there for every note and, yeah. and want to be involved and, and, you know, you know, just, just love the process and, and, and have a lot of ideas and, you know, and uh, yeah, to think all of that is, is fair. hundred percent. You know, so. So one of my favorite questions to ask is, is your perspective, is people's perspective on this. So you've worked with a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of like top songs and stuff, but, and even from top artists, but then also songs that didn't end up going anywhere from top artists. So yeah, I'm curious yeah. in your perspective, what makes quote unquote, the hit song, what makes the song that from the same artist you know, of course, the age old question, if we knew the answer, yeah. you'd be we'd all be That's right. I mean, granted, I think Max Martin kind of knows the answer. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, he batting average is high. <laughs> yeah. But still, you know, like in your perspective, what what makes a song stand out? Man, I think. Man, I have a big answer. I'm ready for it. Let's see what we got. So let me just let me just let me attack the business side of my answer and then I'll attack the art side of my answer. The business side of my answer is that once a song goes out into the universe and 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 you know whether that's whether you have a major label or whether you're a person in your house that's going to put it on YouTube or whatever, once it goes out there into the universe to be consumed, right? It is such an a bizarre, you know, unquantifiable equation of like the stars aligning in the right place at the right time and how it maybe contrasts to what else is happening in the universe and, and all the, I mean, musically, uh, you know, all these, all these kinds of, to, in my opinion, kind of unknown variables, but the, the, the bottom line is a lot of stars have to align for a song from a business standpoint to go be a hit. Now I could also ask you, you know, well, what is your definition of a hit? Because I can give you examples of, you know, there's an artist named Maren Morris that I've been I've worked sure. on her records for a long time. And, you know, the first release she ever had was a song called my church. Mm -hmm. And it's still one of her biggest songs. It's it, 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 from a sales perspective, you know, she still plays it at the end of her shows every night. It's one of the, you know, it's, it has undeniably, you know, resonated with the people. On the charts, that song died at number 14. It was not a number one hit, right? Mm. In terrestrial radio, you know? So, so there's cases like that where, you know, I'm like, well, is it, in, are we basing on if it was successful, like based on, you know, its reaction, based on, based on, awards it might have won critical response i mean she won a grammy for my church yeah and it died at 14 mm -hmm. so um, that's very interesting all these so, different levels of success you know where you yeah, where are you so, looking that's very so, interesting so, so that's first and foremost is you know well, like what do you you know what what do you what are we going to call a hit song and yeah there's yeah. obvious like you know you can say yeah uptown funk was a huge hit <laughs> song right like sure, undeniably yeah. at every measurable metric sure. but but you know for the rest of the, you know, the, the mortal songs, there's, there's varying ways to, to gauge what you think was a hit or what was this, I would even say what was a successful release, mm -hmm. for you, right? Because while that song may not have been a number one on charts, it undeniably catapulted Marin's career sure. and was a successful release. On the, that's my business answer. On the art answer, what makes a hit song is I'm back to this idea of like, <laughs> Um, uh, you know, there's a producer mentor of mine guy here in town that 
that has worked on a lot of big, huge records. And his, his joke line is production is overrated because he says the, the vast majority of music fans are going to just say, do I like the song? Do I like the singer? That's kind of it, right? And so what I glean from that is that what you're really looking for is a listener to feel a sort of authenticity from what's being presented to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I could say examples of like, I loved that, um, you know, the Bruno Mars 24 karat album thing, right? And, and, you know, it's super throwback and, you know, like you listen to it and, and if you're a a kid that was around in the nineties, like you're like, Oh my God, this is all that stuff. And it, and I think part of the reason that album was so successful and had those hits was because it was authentic to Bruno and the guys mm-hmm. making that record. And he chose collaborators that like loved that music and were from that era and got that. And it's like actually in their DNA, they weren't like doing it as some sort of like magic trick or something, or like, chasing some sound right they also weren't chasing something that was happening they're like we're gonna make this record that's this shit that we love right and i think whether you're talking about you know chris stapleton playing a song with an acoustic guitar and very you know minimal production or you're talking about you know the slickest most like super produced you know even we talk about something like max martin like even if some of those songs aren't necessarily the most like um, lyrically compelling, right? You believe that like the people were having fun making that record and that like sonically, like he's grabbing all the right gears because it's, he's the guy, you know, like he went to the source, right? It's all those sorts of kinds of things. And so, and I think that's a reason that there are genres of music because I think that you can be compelled and feel authenticity in an in the song Back in Black as you can, you know, uh, a Lady Gaga track as you can, you know, I mean, Lady, man, that's another one. What a great example, right? You, you completely believe the, you know, the kind of like monster era of Lady Gaga and you completely believe when she does the, the duets with Tony Bennett and you completely believe when she does the soundtrack for Star is Born, right? And the production's are all over the place and it's all these kinds of things. But she has found a way both with her own voice and within who she chooses to collaborate to make songs that she can be authentic, you know? And, and that's, again, testament to her. She has all those gears. She's yeah. a Berkeley kid. She, did, she legitimately loved jazz music. She's a legitimate singer. She legitimately loves pop and pop production. And, the, you know, so it's like, again, big credit to her. But I think I mean, if we get back to the kind of the artistic part of like, well, what's going to be a successful release for you? Or what's going to mm-hmm. be a, a song that people resonate with or that we could say moves the needle? I think at the end of the day, the, 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 the average listener is going to be compelled by something that they feel like is authentic and that's not chasing and that's not pandering Mm. and um and that they feel like was done with intention you know and and look there's always going to be an except an exception like we will have the macarenas and the who let the dogs out that you know but but those are exceptions to the rule and so if you're you know if if you're looking to kind of bat the average i think you chase authenticity um, you know, because that's the part that I feel like is relatively recreatable. Yeah. Those kind of cultural moments that just, those things that just happen, you can't do anything about that. That's just like, man, why did this happen? Who knows? Yeah. But it happened. Um, uh, you know, this, man, so walk, interesting, walk, man, last, last thing I'll use, there's a please, guy in please. town, there's a guy in town, Walker Hayes. It's a country artist mm-hmm. and he's been here for years and has been making great music. And I've worked on great music with him for years and just a, a great dude and like making cool shit. And it was the Applebee's song that yep. blew him up out of nowhere. And like, no one saw it coming. His own record label didn't see it coming. Nothing. That was a cultural moment. Mm-hmm. And it's unrealistic to think that Walker can then go in and just recreate 
the Applebee's thing over and over, right? Um, uh, but what is, you know, believable or what feels like can be done is him continually recreating the music that he's made for a long time, which is authentic. And hopefully now that will bring an audience to him that yeah. can take that music and accept that, you know, but it's, it's not realistic to think he can just go in and keep churning out those. That song is actually called fancy like, by the way, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, that, yeah. but yeah, you know, it's, it's, he's not going to go write those every day. Yeah. And then what happened to it out in the universe isn't going to happen every day either. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that, very, very, very interesting point you made. And, and I've asked a lot of people this question and I get typically three answers. One is authenticity. Two is specificity. And oh. three is um, vulnerability. Ah, and, but I've always been, you, I, th I think you'd probably explain the authenticity the best out of everybody so far because... I'm always a lot of people pair authenticity with with um, vulnerability, and I'm like I, I struggle with that to some degree because I'm like, so does that mean that like every song you have to bear your soul kind of thing? Right. And right. like, but then you look at Twenty Four Carat, and he's not bearing it, but he's but you explained it super well. It's it's just authentic to him, whether he's talking about picking daisies in the yard or whether he's talking about burying his mom. They're authentic to him, Absolutely. and that is super fascinating. Lady Gaga again, authentic to her. You know, she's not or cha you said chasing. They're not chasing. They're not pandering. That was yeah. a very, very, very interesting um, explanation of authenticity. I think. Well, I really I think, appreciate that. Well, I think too the you know the kind of sidebar conversation to that is, you know, anyone that's pretty talented can hear what's happening currently on the radio, and then go make a sound alike. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the era of splice and sample packs and all yeah. this stuff. And it's like, you know, I can use the same cashmere snaps that <laughs> I heard on this Selena Gomez record and yep. put it on, you know, and you can do a pretty, con you know, a pretty convincing fake. And, and that's to a certain degree, to a certain degree, that's the part I kind of think about is like pandering. Sure. Um, and, 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 and I think what you have to kind of remind yourself of is like, well, yeah, we want to be aware of what's happening culturally, but it doesn't mean that like that's the only avenue to success yes. here. And in fact, I think when you go back and you look at some of the biggest hits that we've seen in our industry, they they come out in a time where they are very contrast to everything yeah. else that's happening on the radio at the time. Mm -hmm. And and then of course you immediately have some chasers that don't quite thing, but then it levels out, and then then suddenly it's just kind of like oh well this is another acceptable path to hit music right. Yeah. Uh, so I so think that's the kind of stuff you always have to kind of be, be considerate of and, and, and be thoughtful of. And, and, you know, back to my own self with the jazz thing, like, man, dude, if someone hired me to like produce their jazz record, it would not go well, you know, yeah. and I could still do all the things I could go hire all the heaviest cats and like take two weeks and dig into, you know, Miles Davis or whatever. <laughs> and like, it would still probably not come out great because it's just not a part of my, it's not in my DNA. Yeah. Right. It, it would be learned behavior. It's not like something that comes, it's not instinct. It's learned behavior. Yeah, man. That's such that's a that's fascinating. A that was such an incredible uh, um, explanation of authenticity. I think, I think that that is, I don't, I haven't heard it explained like that. And I think it's going to help a lot of people understand that aspect of songwriting. That was a really good yeah. insight. I really appreciate your time, man. And one of the last questions I have for you, my favorite question, or one of the, my favorite questions that I always like ending every conversation with is, what is one thing that you currently know now in your career that you wish you knew when you first started? Oh, um, I would say that um, it'll be a little bit of a long answer, but I'll say it's not, it's, it, not it's, it's not super simple, but I think it it's important is that, when you're trying to get going, you know, um, I'll use a baseball analogy again. It's like, it's, you want to go out there and you want to show everybody what you can do. Right. And so like every, every time you kind of get an opportunity at bat, the, you know, your instinct is to try to swing for the fences. Right. And you, you want to hit homers and you want to, you want to show everybody, look, I can hit home runs. Um, but the reality is, is, Sometimes you show up to, to work or to create or whatever we're going to call it. And your pitch just doesn't come that, that day. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. So like, it's like, to me, 
I have been successful in my career by slowly coming to the realization that like, man, I'm better off to not swing for the fences on pitches that aren't mine and end up striking out. And instead, like, if I can just get on base a couple times and, and earn my place in the lineup the next time, eventually my pitch will come. Hmm. And, and, and a, a, like a, you know, a direct example of that is sometimes as a guitar player, you know, you get booked on a record or a session that's not necessarily guitar forward. Maybe you get booked on a bunch of songs where there's no guitar solos, or maybe it's singer songwriter music. That's way more about restraint, or maybe it's pop music where the guitars are really just kind of like added percussion or finding your role. But the point is, is like, you know, uh, what am I going to do? Try to shoehorn some, you know, solo into this just to try to prove to everybody I can play a great solo and it doesn't really fit and haul up the works, you know, or I can just be cool and do what's appropriate. And they're probably going to call me back. And you know what? Two things are going to happen. Either they're going to call me back and I am going to get a fastball sometime, or maybe I'll never get a fastball, but they'll still call me back for 10 years because I'm doing the right thing and getting on base. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? So I would say that like, you know, something I wish I had figured out way sooner was that idea of like, Hey man, just like live to fight another day, go in there mm. and service the song or the environment or that moment. And yeah, if you didn't get a chance to show that you can hit a home run that day, that you're a power swinger, like it's fine. Like yeah. you got on, you got on base and everybody had a good time and you will get another opportunity. Yeah, like that's a, that's a big thing. I wish I knew. No, absolutely. Early. I want to piggyback on that really quickly because I I think you said a really interesting point. You said live, live to fight another day or live to see another day, mm -hmm. and I think that that's a really interesting point. And it kind of piggybacks on everything you've said in this conversation. Where something I'm noticing in myself lately, and I think a lot of musicians will be able to relate to this, is the fact that like I think we see where we want to be ten steps ahead, and we we're like, wow, it's so far away. So to some degree, it's almost like paralyzing to even get there to some degree. Like you're like, how do I, I how do I, I, this is where I am now. I want to be there. I, I don't really know how to get there. So it's just like, I don't know what to do. And you almost end up doing nothing to some degree. Well, like you said, you just take the next right opportunity, just one opportunity. And that one opportunity might be the oppor 10 of those opportunities might be helping you, every opportunity is helping you get there. You know, and it's, it's one living to see another day, living to see another day, living to see another day. And. Absolutely. And by at some point you will likely get to that, that place. But like when we look too far ahead, it can become really paralyzing. Yeah. Because it, yeah. I mean, the, and the reality is if you're, you know, I feel like we're kind of like-minded in this, like when you, you know, when you're, when you want to be somewhere, you know, when you want to climb a mountain, it's like the, you know, the kind of progress that people like us want to see will not happen over days and weeks. So it happens true. over months and years. Yeah. So, you know, when you, if you, you know, if you are passionate and you're driven about something, yeah, you want to start songwriting and have a hit song in six months. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen, you know? So I understand why you want it. I wanted it that way too. You know, yeah. you, 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 you find your claw for it, but we're, we're, we circle all the way back to managing expectations, right? hundred percent, man. And for me, for me, what the reality of my career has been, it, it, it was absolutely not ever, man, it was crazy. I just woke up one day and I was like, you know, I went in or I played this one session and then the next day, everybody in town started hiring. me. It was, man, I set out to do this, you know, and specifically on the session part, it's like 11 years ago, I wanted to be a session player and somewhere along the lines, shit, it happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. here I am like that's yeah. you know I've got awards back here and yeah. you know wow it kind of happened I don't even really know when it happened but at some point I looked up and here we are and that's the you know that's the that's going to be most people's path yeah so if you can approach it that way you know I think you're better off in the front end manage the expectations well I really appreciate you taking the time man it has been an absolute pleasure if you could hold on for two more seconds I want to thank every single person that watched or listened wherever you you heard it or streamed this conversation I really hope that it blessed you and you really uh, I hope you took I, I recommend you take a, a second listen with a notepad because uh, we had some really interesting Derek had some phenomenal points in this so thank you so much for 
for listening. Thank you again, Derek. Best way to support this channel is checking out my own original music. So have a great rest of your day. Subscribe to the channel. God bless and peace out. Cheers.